Hey guys, how's it going? Thank you for joining me today in this new tutorial. First and foremost, I wanted to thank you so much for your praise and comments and feedback in my other tutorials. Um, it helped me uh, grow as a professional. Um, I do make some mistakes sometimes that I always correct afterwards, so thank you for for telling me uh, if I'm, you know, mispronounced or um, if I make a mistake towards uh, photography. Uh, I'm transitioning towards being a professional. I don't have like a huge background in photography like years and years. I only started four years ago. My motto is that if you don't make mistakes, you're not gonna learn. So thanks for correcting me. Thanks for uh, pitching in and helping me do that. In my previous tutorials, I talked about how to take single photos of the night sky, how to improve noise, how to choose your camera, how to choose your lenses. Um, so all those are basic stuff. And I felt like something was missing um, from all the basics. And actually someone reminded me today on Facebook that I should do this video, which was long overdue. So today I'm going to talk about um, taking your astro photos, your single astro photos, and putting them together to make a film. This is called a time lapse. So the point of today is to talk about um, time lapse in general, all the basics uh, for you to create a movie of the night sky, basically. Um, and this is pretty important to me because this is what I actually specialize in. So this is why it was so long overdue. By the way, you can subscribe and join our group on Facebook. The link will be down below in the comments, which is dedicated to astral lapse, so time lapse of astrophotography. And uh, we're talking about, we're sharing our work and we're talking about how to improve um, our techniques uh, day by day. So you can do that, and in another part, in the second part of the video, I'll be talking about how to improve your skills and how to improve your gear, uh, your positioning and all that so that you can create sharper images, uh, better, more contrasted, smoother. So all that in the second part, and hopefully you can uh, achieve beautiful time lapses at some point like this one. To shoot a simple and motionless astro time lapse, you will need the exact same gear as for your stills. That is to say, first off, your camera that can handle low light conditions. Second off, a fast and sharp lens that can gather a lot of light. Third off, a sturdy tripod to avoid vibrations while the shutter is gathering light. The point of a time lapse is that it's as smooth and nice to look at as possible, so you want to avoid any jittering. Next, an intervalometer that's able to take several pictures in a row and set intervals. Then, perhaps a lens dew heater that will prevent condensation from forming onto the glass as you are spending several hours outside. Then, you will need a long-lasting battery, like uh, battery grips or external battery supplies that can last for several hours. Then, you will need a big enough SD card to store a lot of images, sometimes thousands. And lastly, you will need some patience. Time lapse requires you and your gear to sit there for a long time, depending on how long you want your sequence to be. I recommend taking lots of food supply, water, and warm clothes. Planning your time lapse is very important and decisive as to whether your final sequence will look great. Remember that time lapse are single astrophotos put together. So you need the gear and the conditions that can produce the best single photos with maximum detail, light, contrast, and minimum noise. That's why it's important to maximize your chances of getting good shots by planning. For example, it's easier to try a time lapse in an area you know well or you like. Starting from that location, you need to plan accordingly checking the weather 
Is it going to rain? Is it going to be humid in the air? Is it going to freeze? Is there going to be a lot of wind? Of course, perfect weather conditions may vary with your location, but generally speaking, perfect conditions rarely exist. So there's also going to be a bit of a luck factor. Depending on what you want to shoot, whether it's planets, moon, aurora, Milky Way, etc., you're going to want to plan that as well to time them with your foreground. For aurora shooting, there's some apps and websites that can help you predict them. I will put some links in the description below. For all astronomy related, I personally use the Starwalk app. It's an amazing paying app that can tell you the position of the celestial objects depending on your GPS locations, so you can plan your shot accordingly. For example, if you want to shoot a beautiful seascape to the west with the Milky Way, scroll to the time when the Milky Way will be west, that is to say probably in the fall if you're in the northern hemisphere. When all that is planned and you feel ready, pack up your gear and get out there. In Astro Time Lapse there are no surprises or miracles. You will learn by making mistakes and it might seem very frustrating at the start because you didn't get the expected results. But once you put persistence and patience into it, you will soon get very happy. Alright guys, bear with me for a second. Before going further, you need to understand some of the theory behind the time lapse. A film is made of several images put back to back at a certain frame rate. That's how many frames per second it contains. Ordinary cinema movies contain 24 frames per second, actually just a bit less. But that's enough to give a smooth look to an animated series of images. For a smoother look, you can increase the number of frames per second. Some other well-used rates are 25 frames per second or 30 or even 60 frames per second for an extra smooth film. Be careful though, for a final sequence to be interesting enough, you generally need several seconds so that your audience has the time to understand what they are looking at. If no effect is needed like a quick transition, you generally need between 6 and 12 seconds. Of course, this is subjective and many people will get longer clips that they can edit out in post-process because it's always good to have more than not enough. But the longer your sequence is, the more frames it is going to contain. So the longer you're going to stay out with the risk of running out of battery if you don't have battery grips, for example. From my experience, you can choose a starting frame rate of 30 frames per second it will give you smooth enough sequences. Then, if you want 12 seconds worth of final sequence, you will need 12 times 30, so 360 frames in total. If each of your frame takes 15 seconds plus the interval of, say, 5 seconds between the shots, you will be out for at least 2 hours. This is one more thing to plan ahead, but once you have it, I recommend to stick with it to be consistent with the other sequences that you're going to take. I personally work with 24 and 30 frames per second and always take between 200 or 300 shots. So that gives me the choice of deciding the frame rate in post-process when I assemble my time-lapse depending on what I shoot. When you're all set up with all those things in mind, go to your preferred location and set up your gear in a stable area that is protected from the wind, humidity and other things from mother nature that can harm your gear and create jitter in your final production. Remember to level your composition and find things in the foreground that can be interesting like branches, water or things that will easily silhouette against the night sky. For a nice look, artists often observe the one-third, two-third rule. The foreground should occupy one-third while the background sky should ob observe two-third. It is very subjective though, so it is up to your imagination. Once your gear is set up and you're ready to roll, turn on your camera and plug in your intervalometer and maybe your lens heater already so that your lens doesn't lose too many degrees. Now comes the time to do three things. And the first one being adjusting the settings of your camera. It's very important to keep the same settings throughout the entire sequence to avoid lighting and noise problems. That's why if you're not shooting what we call day to night or night to day time lapses where the lighting is changing, you need to keep the settings constant and shoot during a period of time when the lighting is also the same. You will need to set up your camera in the same way you would for single stills. Set your camera to bulb mode so that your remote controls the shutter. 
set your camera to raw pictures so you can get full advantage of uncompressed images to edit. Turn off the built-in ISO noise reduction of your camera. As you're shooting for the first time, I suggest you open your aperture wide open to gather as much light as possible. You can always decrease it to get sharper images with less vignette and distortion afterwards. That's when owning a good lens comes into play. Watch my tutorial on lenses for more info. What about the shutter now? This is the crucial part of time-lapse because it's all connected to your lens, its focal length, the subject that you're shooting, the final length of your time-lapse and the time you want to spend outside. In general, you need a wide lens to try and get as much in the frame as possible. You need to remember that the aspect ratio of a still picture is two-thirds, while the general aspect ratio of movies is 16 ninth. So if you want to put a movie together that will fit nicely on social media or any video platform, you will need to crop two-thirds into 16 ninth, meaning the horizontal length of your frame isn't going to change, but its vertical one will. When cropping, you're going to lose data. That's why you want a wide enough lens to pack as much as possible into the final 16 to 9th ratio. You can also set your camera to 16 to 9th ratio directly on the spot, but I recommend not using it because you might miss something interesting. You can always crop later in post-process. Go-to focal length for time-lapse are about from 8 mm to 24 mm. Above that, you might miss your shot and it gets more technical when you reduce the focal length. Let's say you're shooting with a 14 mm lens on a full frame, like a still, you will need to follow the 500 rule. In reality, time lapse is a bit more lenient towards that rule because the star trail gets less visible when stars are moving on the final sequence. But for sharpness reasons, I recommend to stick to that rule. If you don't know about it, watch my first tutorial. So for 14 millimeters, I would use between 20 and 30 seconds, for example. Noise on a still is a thing, but noise on a movie is another. Noise moves around in a film because the pixels didn't get the same value from one frame to another, creating variation in color and light. So the noise looks like it's alive and you can really get distracted if it gets too high. Depending on your camera, you need to find your optimum ISO and stick to it even lower it one or two notches. You can always up your exposure time to compensate. That's when getting a good camera comes into play. Watch my tutorial on noise and cameras for more info. Now, the big second thing you need to adjust is the focus. Taking a time lapse is different from taking a still because you cannot change the settings halfway to get everything in focus. That's why a good lens with a short focusing distance is better to get as much of the landscape in focus as possible. To focus at infinity, utilize the zoom times 5 and times 10 built in your live view mode and zoom in on a light source. Adjust the focusing ring back and forth. When these specks of light change color, generally from blue to red or orange to green, they're in focus, right in the middle. You can also focus on bright objects at infinity if it's easier. Remember that lowering your aperture a bit will increase your chances to get the right focus. Eventually, the third thing you need to set before starting your sequence is the intervalometer. On the usual remotes, there are four items to set up. I recommend leaving the delay to zero. Since the remote is telling the camera to time of exposure, set your time to the desired amount of seconds. The intervals is pretty important setting to set, and it will completely change from subject to subject and focal length. If you're time-lapsing a slow-moving object at a wide focal length like the Milky Way, you might want to set your intervals to 15 to 30 seconds or even longer to actually see the Milky Way move across the frame. For faster objects like auroras, you will need a faster interval and shutter speed. Set your intervals as tight as possible to catch the fine details in the aurora and allow a stunning, sharp and smooth evolution of the lights. However, between each picture, your camera needs to process the shot and send the info to the SD card, and it takes more or less 3 seconds depending on the type of the camera you have. And never go lower than 3 seconds, because if the camera is not finished writing the data onto the SD card, and already starts the next shot. Your exposure time will not be consistent between the shots and you will start seeing flicker in the final movie. When you start increasing your focal length, remember that the stars, actually the Earth, will rotate faster because it's zoomed in. The objects will then disappear more rapidly from your frame, so you will need to decrease your shutter speed as well as your intervals. For example, if you want to take a sequence of the Milky Way core at 50mm, 
it will be nicer to use 5 to 10 seconds interval rather than 15 to 30 seconds. Finally set up the number of shots of the sequence. I believe the limit is set to 399 on usual intervalometers, but you need to enter this number anyways. Now, once you're set with all those three elements, you can press the start button of your remote, tuck it in safely and leave the camera to the task at hand. Remember not to touch the setup in any case, even grabbing the remote at times might introduce unwanted vibrations that will be visible on the final product. So kick back, relax and enjoy the night sky with some warm tea or coffee. If you felt like the shooting part was tiring, then you should probably think twice about it. Because the post-processing is equally as challenging, demanding and crucial. If you captured good data, eh, you can still turn it into usable footage if you don't have what we call a workflow. A workflow is a process comprised of several manipulations aiming at turning your single pictures into a final quality clip. Every time lapser has their own workflow and you can always improve your workflow. I am myself constantly learning new tricks and uh, softwares to improve my workflow. The goal here for you is to create your workflow, so the workflow you're comfortable with that is as lossless as possible for your files. Um, so here's a basic workflow that you can follow. Step number one, import and save your files into your computer or a drive. Step number two, process your raw files. You can use any editing software, although Adobe Lightroom offers the best performances and is now compatible with multiple time-lapse softwares. Like your single pictures, edit your pictures in a way that suits you. You are the judge of your own work after all. Two things to watch though. The first one is local adjustments. As your objects are moving across the sky, you cannot use local adjustments for them. You can separately edit the sky and the foreground, but not separate objects in the sky unless you want to edit your photos one by one. The second thing to watch is the exposure, the blacks, the whites the contrast and clarity and saturation buttons. Exposure is an amplification much like the ISO, so turning it up too much will increase the noise. In the same way, increasing lights, contrast and clarity will do the same. Don't oversaturate your shots either, you will get color noise. With that in mind, there's a function in Lightroom that lets you copy the adjustments of the first image and paste them onto the others so you don't have to actually edit each picture. Step number three, exporting. Once you're content with it, export using JPEG at maximum quality in a folder. On a side note, exporting in TIFF will create files that are way too large. Step four, assemble. There are plenty of assembling softwares available on the internet, some better than others, some paying and some free. I personally use the paying software called Sequence for Mac, but there are many others. Even the QuickTime software and film editing softwares usually offer a time-lapse assembly option. So, inside the software you're going to need to decide on the frame rate, dimensions and quality or resolution and a codec. First off, find a frame rate that is comfortable for your eyes and you can try out different ones and see which one you prefer. The dimensions of your sequence is how many horizontal and vertical lines it contains. It defines the quality, for example, 180p, 2K or 4K. By default, the softwares usually crop the images to the 16 to 9th ratio, unless you tell them to use the same dimensions as the photos. I recommend the latter, because the software automatically crops in the middle, so you might want to keep the same format as the picture for now and choose to crop it later. The quality is very important, as it is the number of pixels in each frame of the sequence. Nowadays, cameras usually have sensors of more than 12 megapixels. So there's enough pixel in there to turn your images into a 4K UHD sequence, meaning the resolution of about 4,000 pixels horizontally. In reality, 4K UHD is 3,840 horizontal pixels by 2,160 pixels vertically, and UHD means that it fits the TV and computer monitor standards. For example, YouTube has adopted the 4K UHD as a standard. I would recommend using the highest resolution possible, but notice that the space needed to support a 12 second 4K or even 8K file is generally higher than 1 or 2 gigs. 
Once you've chosen a resolution, you need to choose a codec. A codec is a program that encodes the stream of signal, so the data in your file, in a certain format that is readable or decodable by different output sources for playback or editing. It will affect the general quality of your file. You will have to choose between a series of codecs like MPEG, H264, 265, or Apple ProRes, for example. There's where you alone have to do a little bit of research. You need to find a compromise between the final quality of your shot and the storage room that you have. As you can imagine, there are no surprises. Using a lossless codec will result in conserving stunning quality, but your file will easily take over 10 gigs of space. In my opinion, you can forget the MPEG format as it compresses the file so much that you will lose more than 60% of your original quality. A good compromise is H264 or 265, as it compresses the file but leaves a very decent quality. YouTube accepts this codec to play back its videos, and H264 is a standard web codec. If you want to keep your files at the top-notch quality, you can use the Apple ProRes codecs. I personally use the Apple ProRes 422 for each time-lapse sequence. It's approximately three times as much quality as the H264. When I export and archive entire movie projects, I only use the H264 though. When you've made up your mind, you can export your project as a clip and there you go, you're done. watch the sequence for the first time, you're probably not going to be that satisfied at first, but that's because there are tons of things that can be improved, but generally speaking, when you're going to start seeing the Milky Way moving across the sky, you're going to have a really, really good feeling um, of, of happiness and accomplishment. You're going to watch your first sequence and you're going to see things that you probably don't like. For example, uh, say you're shooting during a night where you have a lot of wind and there's a lot of vibrations and jitter. So uh, there are ways of improving that. Also, um, you might notice some flickering in, in the frames, during the frames because of the time of exposures, like we said earlier in the video. Um, there are also ways of adjusting that in post-process. So the first thing you want to adjust is probably the camera settings. For example, the time of exposure you might want to adjust a bit. The aperture uh, you want to probably stop down maybe two, three notches like we said in my previous tutorials um, to get a sharper and less vignetting uh, shot. Also, you might want to adjust the ISO to, uh, to compensate. You might want to adjust the interval so you don't get this uh, annoying flicker between the shots. Another thing you might want to adjust prior is that at some point you're going to shoot and shoot and shoot and you're going to find that your camera sitting alone on a tripod is kind of boring. That's what I felt recently, you know, I was looking at my shots and I felt hmm, there's something missing, it's and you know it's static. And uh, know that you can add some motion to it to make them more interesting to look at. So for example, you can use this one. It's called a ramp or motion control dolly, and it enables your camera to move um, back and forth like this, to slide like this, uh, to add some motion while it's shooting. Also, you might want to add a panning movement and also tilting. I don't have it here, this is the SERP, I just got it. Uh, so I'm going to try it out. So know that you can also create a movement by using a tracker. So a tracker is a device that follows the rotation or compensates for the rotation of the Earth. So it follows uh, the night sky. So it also creates a movement. Now there are tons of ways to improve your post-process workflow. First, let's say you're shooting in changing light conditions like a sunset or uh, uh, the sunrise, for example. Then you might want to adjust your camera accordingly, that is to say, put it in the aperture mode. Aperture mode uh, will allow your camera to gradually um, increase or decrease, so adjust the, the time of exposure 
knowing that this aperture is set like this, that would enable you to take photos that are at the same exposure level. And then in post-process, you can use some softwares like LR Timelapse or um, the Timelapse plugin for Lightroom that will enable you to take the first frame and then the last frame and then to adjust um, the lights, the temperature and all the settings like this between those two frames, between those uh, keyframes we call them. You can select two or several ones. So these are the things that I might do a, another tutorial later about. Um, those are technical things, but for now, my recommendation is for you to get out there and try the time lapse over and over and over again. You're gonna take thousands of shots, so that's gonna take time, that's gonna take patience, uh, but all in all, you're gonna succeed in it. And remember that if you're consistent in your setup and then your workflow, uh, and between your, your sequences, you're going to be able to shoot beautiful time-lapse sequences and eventually uh, make some films out of them. So that's it for today, folks. Thank you for watching this new tutorial about the basics of time-lapses. I hope you really enjoyed it and that it's going to enable you to go out there and try time-lapse. It's really rewarding. You will see, you will be, yes, I got my first time lapse. So if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. Also, uh, don't hesitate to comment if I mispronounced or forgot something, please do that again. Uh, that will enable me to, uh, of course, correct in the description as much as I can. Also, please uh, check out my social media platforms for regular updates, photos, and videos. And uh, if you feel like you want to support me on Patreon, please feel free to do that. There will be a link in the description below also. So until next time, I hope very, very soon. Um, take care. Bye-bye.